I'm not going to get to 30 of those, probably. I'll do my best. Some are uh, somewhat, uh, they repeat or overlap, so that's helpful. Um, just a couple of general questions. First, Carl, with regard to your book, what kind of feedback have you been getting? Uh, the book is really, for a scholarly work to have as much circulation, is pretty impressive. Yeah, I think uh, both myself and my publisher were completely taken aback by the reception, the positive reception. Um, it sold about, I think, 15 times as many books as they originally ordered, which is, which is huge. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's created a headache for my financial advisor, Patrick Birch, but he's been great on that front. But it's been very positive on that front. I think that, I, I, this, this is an odd way to put it, but the summer of 2020 was great preparation for a book like this, because I think in the summer of 2020, and the book was completed in 2019, but the summer of 2020 brought onto the public stage in an explosive way precisely the kind of fragmentation that the book was attempting to, to analyze. And so uh, I think that the, the time, had the book been published a year earlier, I think it would not have struck a chord. I think in the fall of 2020, a lot of people were wondering, everything seems to be flying out of control at this particular point. Why is this? Is there any logic? Is there any reason? Or is this just a momentary chaotic blip? And I think the book, um, was not intended to, to address that specific issue, but I think help people think through that. Uh, for those who are wondering, you probably, maybe some of you have heard that there's a, uh, not a Cliff Notes version, that's for sure, but a smaller version of the book that's supposed to be published that could be used in class settings with study guide. What's the update on that? And what did you have to take out to do, to do that? <laughs> I had to take a lot out, but I also put some new stuff in because the book did generate some good uh, feedback, some good pushback, and I continue to read up on things. And one of the chapters in the book, for example, deals with why is nationhood in such crisis at the moment? Uh, I mean, I think many of us, I'm not an American citizen as yet, but I moved here three weeks before 9-11 in 2001. And so I've been an inside-outsider observer of America for 20 years. And I've ne the nation I witness, I'm witness to now is not the same one that I came to 20 years ago. And it, it's, it, it A, staggers me that so many Americans are ashamed to be Americans. And as a non-American, I think America has been a great force. Not a perfect force for good, but has been a great force for good in the world. Uh, but secondly, the speed at which American self-confidence has, has hit such a, a crisis point. So I try to deal with... There was another sentence that I could have used for the book, and I, I decided to do the trans thing instead, but I was also intrigued by a sentence that kept popping up in sort of 2014, 2015 in the British news. And that was, uh, he pledged allegiance to ISIS online. Hmm. And that intrigued me, because here you, have an ex here you have a statement about young men from very affluent homes, typically in the southeast of England, so their parents were London professionals somehow finding ISIS, something that they only knew via websites, to grip their imagination more than the English national story. And I saw it again last year in 2020. I was very struck with the, the George Floyd protests and, and, and some of the riots associated uh, with, those incident, with, with that incident. Uh, Britain had them too, at the same time as the Chinese government was crushing, attempting to crush the democracy movement in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong was a British colony until 1997. I remember sitting, watching the television and seeing Robin Cook, the foreign secretary, sign the treaty and then be taken away on a jet launch away from Hong Kong. So Hong Kong was a British colony until very, very recently. No protest in Britain about the Hong Kong thing. And it struck me, this is interesting that People's imaginations are being gripped now in a way that doesn't reflect old national boundaries. And I think that's part and parcel of some of the stuff I deal with in the first book, and I expand that in the second book. So it's a shorter book, but there's also some new stuff there that I think is, that I'm still thinking through, but, and again, I think technology, yeah. because the screen is more real than the man next door. 
And that's a very worrying situation to be in. Can a society survive when the fiction we see online, and by fiction I mean the imaginative world that the tech people create, is more real to me than the neighbor I pass when I head out to work in the morning? Well, there's, there's a lot of questions related to what you just, I'm trying to pick, there's, there's so many of them to, uh, but several folks are asking about, especially as a professor and you deal with students, how are you advising students to interact with that technology? Um, you mentioned YouTube and TikTok, but I'm certain this must be something that's uh, just massive in, among that age group. How do you deal with that? Yeah. How do you advise, even if you're thinking you're talking to parents about this, what are yeah. some things you might suggest? Well, I think as far as parents go, I don't buy you, don't buy your child a smartphone. I mean, just don't. They're going to hate you for it, but that's... Parents have to do stuff their kids hate because they're parents and their kids are young and stupid. Uh, I mean, put it bluntly, there's a reason why parents look after kids, not vice versa, and that is parents are supposed to know what they're doing and kids don't. Uh, it doesn't solve the problem entirely because he's then going to stop and playing with their friends who own smartphones. Well, you know, I, I'm glad that my wife and I never had to face that dilemma, but I think as far as technology goes, parents need to be very proactive in controlling and restricting the access that their children have to technology. Uh, I think for older kids, one of the things I just try to do in class is, is press on them, positively and negatively, I to press on them the beauty of books. Uh, and of great thoughts and the beauty of sitting on your deck, having a glass of wine with a friend, the beauty of having a meal with people you know and love and like. Uh, so I try to positively promote a, a vision of life that way. And negatively, I try to draw their attention to what technology does. And I use technology. To, I mean, we're all in, deeply embedded in technology. There's no way of getting, getting out of it. But I think when you know the dangers, you know, to know the script is to change the script to some extent. So I would say be aware of what technology is doing. It's not just internet pornography that's damaging young people. It's, it's other things as well. Um, and I also think it's worthwhile, parents, this is tangential, but on the the sexual identity stuff. It's worthwhile the parents themselves looking at some of the stuff that's going on online in order to understand the playbook. Because what's, what's happening is when kids will go to their parents and say, you know, mom, dad, I think I'm trans, that's not coming out of a vacuum. They've been coached online about that. And there's a playbook associated with that. And one of the aspects of that playbook is, and if you don't affirm me, I will commit suicide. Kids are being trained to say that. They're also being trained to say, I've always felt this way. It's complete rubbish most of the time. But as everybody knows, it's absolutely terrifying as a parent to have your kids say, I think I'm going to kill myself. So I think parents need to be aware themselves of some of the coaching that goes on online, some of the playbooks being used so that they can... I'm not saying dismiss their kids when they come to them with these very serious claims or concerns, but at least have some kind of context for understanding, understanding what might be going on. Um, some of these questions are going to feel disconnected because they're just so many I want to try to get to them, and I know you're good on your feet, so we'll see how it goes. Um, here's a question. How do we proactively reverse the damage with those who we are connected with without being labeled as a hater? And this is a, someone who's teaching in a yeah. public school setting, yeah. but even... That's a hard question. First of all, I would say for anyone teaching in a public school setting, uh, I think you're doing courageous and heroic work at this point. Um, I know there are a lot of Christians who sort of damn the public school system, but I think that if, if you're in the public school system, then your brothers and sisters in church should be praying for you. Uh, I think it would be good for you to connect with other Christian teachers in other public schools. They are out there. There is, if not strength in numbers, there can often be encouragement in numbers. So I would say, first of all, don't stand alone. Don't stand alone. Secondly, I would say, you don't have to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. It doesn't all come down to you. Not every hill that you can die on is one that you should die on. 
there's need for, I think, discernment and wisdom in your particular context to know, well, this is a small hill of no real consequence. This is a hill that I've got to die on. Only you can make that choice. I can't sit up here and say, if they ask you to do this, it's worth torching your career. If they're asking you to do that, you can, you can live with that. You have to live with your own conscience. You have to make decisions on that. Um, I do think that it's, it's very hard these days not to be labeled a hater. I get labeled a hater somewhere on the internet almost every day. Uh, yeah, it kind of goes with the territory. Uh, but what I try to do is, is not be hateful. Uh, if, if they're going to accuse me of being a hater, then the only thing they're going to have against me is that I disagree with them. They're not going to be able to point to where I've treated them with great disrespect or cruelty or unpleasantness. And I'm at the moment, uh, I, I have a very good uh, friendly relationship with, uh, with a gay friend. And I think that, that some of the answer to the problem lies in making a distinction between the ideological political movements and some of the individuals. I think that often the individuals, they don't think you're a This particular person I'm thinking of, when we, we were sitting talking, he said, I know you don't hate me, you disagree with me. And, and I do think that on one-to-one, -one, the, there can be hope on that front. In terms of the, 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 the lobby groups, they have a vested interest in presenting you as a hater if you disagree with them. And I think all I would say in that situation is don't give them any evidence that that's the case beyond the fact that you disagree with them. Another uh, question is, have you heard of the metaverse? And if so, can you project how growing development of the metaverse will control culture and group thinking? The term rings a bell, but I can't uh, think of precisely what it is. So. Uh, I think there, it, it has to do with the latest Zuckerberg. Uh, here's another question related to, do you have some thoughts on Facebook's transition to the metaverse? Um, if what's meant is, is an increasing and all-encompassing technologization of all of life, if that's what it's referring to, then I find it very worrying. Uh, I, I did a, a discussion recently with uh, Ryan Anderson and Claire Morrell and a lawyer from the Napa Institute uh, for the EPPC. You can find it online. And one of the points that uh, one, it wasn't me, but one of the other contributors to that discussion was making was, uh, you know, we tend to think of cancellation as having YouTube videos pulled or live streams blocked. And I've had that done to me. Uh, but think about a world where everything is mediated through technology. Will your church be able to have a bank account if it doesn't play along with whatever the taste of the day is in terms of sexual identity politics or whatever the social justice issue of the day is? Uh, I think the capacity for what Rod Dreher refers to as soft totalitarianism is increasing exponentially at this particular point in time. Um, I was in a I was in New York on Monday for a First Things lecture and meeting, and I went with some friends to a bar afterwards, and uh, I had to show my vaccine card to get a drink at the bar. And it just reminded me of, wow, actually, more and more of what would once upon a time be considered private uh, is now public. And I, I am vaccinated. It's not an anti I'm not an anti-vax, pro-vax, whatever. I am vaccinated. But it is to say, I'm not sure that everybody should have the right to know what medical treatments I've had. I don't think I have the right to ask that of a student, actually. But it's becoming commonplace in our society, and I think technology will only increase the potential and power for that. Um, a couple of in the same theme here now. Why do you, can you describe or why do you think evangelicals tend to be so vulnerable to the cultural pressures that you address in your book? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I wonder if we're, we're any more vulnerable than other sectors of society. I think part of the problem is that even, a lot of evangelicals conceded ground without realizing the significance of the ground they'd conceded. Uh, so, for example, on gay marriage, I think the key moment in, for, for marriage law in the United States is 
uh, Governor Ronald Reagan signing no-fault divorce into law in California in 1970 because that reduces marriage to a sentimental bond that exists for the satisfaction of the two parties. It takes no account of the children. It, uh, it, it's just a disastrous move. And yet I, 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 most churches simply blithely have accepted no-fault divorce as, as okay. And I have sympathy there then with gay couples who say, why do you object to my marriage when you've already decided that marriage is a sentimental bond between two people? That's the kind of ground that we've conceded without, real, without thinking through. And I'm not blaming people for not thinking it through because who in 1970 was talking about gay marriage? Virtually nobody in 1970. So I can understand why it wasn't thought through, but I think we have to think very carefully uh, about that. I also think that a lot of evangelicals have not had, they've rested satisfied with a pretty minimal theology, whereas actually Christian theology is pretty comprehensive and sophisticated. That's not me saying unless you have a sophisticated and comprehensive theology, you cannot be a Christian. But it is to say the church needs a sophisticated and comprehensive theology and needs to teach that to its people. Uh, and I think when the church does not have, for example, a rich anthropology, a rich understanding of what it means to be a human being, then when something like homosexuality comes along and all we can do is shout Bible verses at the people we disagree with, to the rising generation of young Christians, that doesn't seem a very adequate strategy. I have kids come to speak to me at Grove and I'll say, you know, what's the Bible's position on homosexuality? And I, I can point them to the Bible verses. And that's good enough for them because they're good Christians. But I also know that at the back of their mind, they're going away thinking, but why does the Bible say that? Is it because God wants my lovely, nice gay friends to be miserable? And that's a serious question. And uh, I, I'm, the discussion I'm in with, with a gay friend at the moment is very much on a sort of, I know what the Bible teaches, but I want to know why the Bible teaches that. And I think that that kind of answer comes from not talking about homosexuality, but from talking about the Bible's vision for what it is to be a human being made in the image of God. And I think it's on that broader stuff. You know, we tended to do the whack-a-mole. Oh, there's a problem here. Let's just address that problem. Rather than... Let's teach the whole counsel of God in a broad and deep way so that when these problems occur, we actually have the resources upon which to draw in order to address them in some kind of constructive way. Yes, yeah, so when you're talking to students or your, your kids for that matter, kids in church, our job is to be laying the, the biblical anthropological framework for them to be able to, when they are confronted with these alternates, um, can at least they start from that standpoint rather yeah. than what's wrong with yeah. this thing. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I think on, on two levels, think about marriage. I think that two ways of addressing the marriage issue. One, the PCA, the OPC, in some ways we don't need to change our confession to address gay marriage because our confessional document, the Westminster Confession, has a good statement about what marriage is that excludes all the other combinations by implication. Uh, secondly, I think the best argument for biblical marriage is biblical marriages. I think we need to think about, people in my generation need to think about how do we show younger people that biblical marriage really is the best way. Well, the way we do that is not by screaming and shouting against other versions of marriage, though that may be necessary on occasion. The primary way we do that is actually by living it out in our own lives and showing people what a a loving marriage means. I, I try to get the students at Grove to think about this by saying, okay, many, you know, I teach a final year course, and typically there are kids in the final year course who are going to get married that summer. And I say, you know, on your wedding day, it's going to be very easy to, my wife smile here, because my biggest gaffe ever when I preached was I said, I remember saying, it's very easy to love your wife on a wedding day because she's never more beautiful than that. I had, the women were lined up out the back door to remind me that's not the case. They remain beautiful and get more beautiful as the years go by. And, and my terrible recovery, because I made that comment and I felt the atmosphere chill. And I did this off the cuff recovery. I, I said, it's all downhill from then on. <laughs> Thinking people would laugh. Nobody laughed. It was really bad. But, but I said, it's going to be really easy to love, you know, there's that 
romance, there's the sexual desire, you're both dressed up and beautifully presented, you're happy, you're looking forward to honeymoon, it's exciting, there's a new phase in your life beginning. It's really easy to love your husband or your wife on your wedding day. But then I say, but think about 50 years, 60 years down the line where the one spouse has descended into Alzheimer's disease and is utterly dependent upon the other spouse caring for their most basic bodily needs. Uh, is that a more loving? Is love being more powerfully demonstrated there? And I think when you use teaching tools like that and you get the students to think, that helps them to realize that what the world is telling them love is, which equates to, is on a spectrum from warm, fuzzy feeling to sexual desire. That's not really what love is. And I, have, I actually have a lot of confidence in young people today that if you, if you come at these questions in the right way, many of them are thoughtful enough to come to the right conclusions. Shifting gears to vocation a bit, because several folks asked at least 10 questions were about how we think through vocation. And I'm sure for young people, that's a, a constant um, issue they're weighing in their minds as they decide how they'll train what they'll do. And several had to do with your grant, the difference between your grandfather and you. And here's one of those questions. Is there something intrinsically wrong with our culture's current idea of what our vocational purposes is versus the culture of your grandfather? Is there benefits that we can take from both of them? Yeah, I think. Uh I would say absolutely. First and foremost, I love having a job that I enjoy. Yeah, and, and I don't think it's wrong to enjoy your job and get satisfaction from your job. Uh, but I do think that our tasks, our earthly vocations, need to be set within what I would call a, a proper anthropological context. When I teach the senior humanities course at Grove, one of the first things I intro introduce is Jean-Jacques Rousseau saying, Man is born free and everywhere is in chains. And I, my commentary on that is this, just because a, a statement is self-evidently ridiculous and nonsense does not mean that people won't believe it and indeed build entire civilizations upon it. And we in the West have built our entire civilization on the notion that man is born free and everywhere is in chains. And I say to them, that's wrong. Man is not born free. Man is born completely and utterly dependent. My wife and I have the great pleasure in next March, hopefully, of, of the arrival of our first grandchild. If my son phones me up the day that grandchild's born and says, Dad, we dropped her off in the woods, we're going back to pick her up in 72 hours because, hey, she was born free and we don't want to put her in chains, that's, that's self-evidently ridiculous. Human beings of all species of animal on the face of the earth are actually born incredibly dependent. When I was a kid, I bred hamsters. Hamsters are capable of standing, I wouldn't say on their own two feet, on their own four feet within about three weeks of birth. No human being is like that. If you've got kids, you'll know they can be in their late 20s before they're capable these days of standing on their own two feet. They're very dependent. So I think what we need to do, in order to think about vocation, we need to first of all think about who we are as human beings. Uh, and I would say we need to think about ourselves first and foremost, not as autonomous free individuals, we need to think about ourselves as always defined by our dependencies upon and responsibilities towards others. Uh, and that should shape every vocation. If you do a job that you love and enjoy, that's great. But don't think that that's, you know, that in itself is enough to justify you doing that vocation. You should also be doing that vocation because it puts bread on the table. Uh, I feel real bad. I mean, I hated it. When I got the cancellation of my flight today, it was kind of, oh, man. And one of the things was, I'm letting the kids down. The kids are paying for me to teach them, and I won't be there on Monday to teach them. And I was glad I felt bad about that, at least initially. Then I thought, hey, and I've also got a day, extra day. of not day. It sort of kicked in. But once I was resigned to my fate. But... That's a good reaction. When your reaction, when something like that happens, your first reaction is, I'm letting other people down. That shows that you're not far from the kingdom of heaven in terms of, of your vocation. So I would say, in terms of thinking of your vocation, do what you're good at, do what you enjoy, but don't just do it because you're good at it and because you enjoy it. Do it because it allows you to meet your responsibilities to other people, whether they're work friends, people in church, 
your wife, your children, whatever. Never lose sight of the fact that your primary purpose is the fulfillment of responsibilities towards others. Because there will come a point in your life, well, there was at the beginning and there will be at the end, when you will be dependent upon others fulfilling their responsibilities towards you. Because you will be dependent at that point. And I think if we can allow that to inform how we imagine ourselves to be in the world, it should answer that question. Thank you. Uh, by God's providence, now you're leaving 5.30 in the morning Monday. That's too bad. Oh, yeah, because, that's the other side of it. <laughs> well, it just so happens in God's providence. We, we uh, run a Christian school, Heritage Christian Academy, and Monday morning I'm doing an in-service with the teachers on biblical anthropology. It would be just providentially wonderful if it happened that you... If my flight's cancelled again. I've already said to my... I mean, if it's cancelled again, Truman I may to have to rent a car and just do the drive. You know? uh, <laughs> It must well, be about 18 hours from here or so, some horrendously yeah, long time. Yeah, that's about right. Yep. I grew up in Britain. We thought that if you drove more than three hours, yeah. you'd probably die. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I remember an American asking a friend of mine, have you ever been to Scotland? And he said, no, no, that's at least four hours away. And yes. it was kind of, you know, that's a year's journey. Now, as I start to wind down a bit, there's a few questions of a similar, um, a similar theme. So I'll ask this one. At the conclusion of your book, you offer three ad admonitions for the church in America. The final one is that Protestants especially need to recover both natural law and a high view of the physical body. Yep. At a practical level, what would Protestant churches with a high view of the body be teaching and doing that they are largely not doing today? Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, I, 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 if I've received any... A number of the people who've done study groups on the book say where they hit the buzzsaw is my plea for natural law which creates this knee-jerk reaction among a lot of Protestants who think if you're arguing for natural law, which is the idea that the world has a moral structure, that we can learn things from the way the world is to inform our ethical thinking, that you're somehow putting up autonomous human reason. Uh, first of all, I want to say in response, one, uh, natural law was a big part of Protestantism until the Dutch kicked it out in the 19th century. That was a problem. Two, uh, I'm not arguing, when I'm, when I'm talking about natural in the book, I'm not really talking about natural law as being a powerful argument in the public square, though I think it can play a role there. I'm talking about natural law functioning within the context of the church. So take, for example, the student who comes to me and says, what does the Bible teach on homosexuality? One, I'm going to point them to the Bible verses. But then they're going to say to me, but why does the Bible teach that? Then I might, for example, pull up some of the statistics, which uh, last time I looked, you can still get from government health sites on the life expectancy and the physical diseases and damage that's done to, uh, that active male homosexuals do to themselves which is, you know, you can pull up those statistics without taking a moral stand and say, look at that, does, does that lifestyle look like a lifestyle that, that you could describe as flourishing? If some guy by the age of 40 is having to wear a nappy because of activities in, he's engaged in or has these horrendous diseases that he's picked up, does that speak to you of a life that's, that's flourishing? And that's where I would sort of introduce natural and say, the Bible teaches this, and guess what? The Bible teaches this because, wow, the world as God has put it together operates along lines that the Bible is describing at that point. So I would say that, that's, you know, particularly the teaching of sexual morality in the church, I'd want to start with saying, you know, human beings, men and women, we have different bodies. They're designed to fit together in some ways, and they're, designed, they're not designed to fit together in other ways. And the medical evidence supports that. Maybe we should take that into account when we're looking at the coherence or the plausibility of the, uh, uh, of the Bible's morality. Some months ago, my wife and I were at uh, a Roman Catholic conference, and one of the lectures was uh, uh, by a Jesuit priest, Robert Spitzer, who has a website that's well worth going to because he has a lot of this information there. The title of the lecture was Defending the Church's Moral Teaching Today. And we thought, we've got to go to that lecture because the Catholics set the bar way up there. I mean, they, they gun for contraception. Look at He's, yeah, he really has got a huge task. And we went and we were struck at the way this guy had got the, st the medical statistics at his fingertips 
and the sociological statistics at his fingertips and went out of his way to say, and I'm quoting this from a secular source, and he was making the point that the Bible's teaching is rendered plausible by the statistics that are put together by non-Christian organizations. So, theology of the body, natural law, I would say, this can have a great pedagogical role, particularly in teaching young people. Uh, I grew up at a time when, by and large, the moral intuitions of society and the moral intuitions of the Christian church on significant issues ran along the same lines. Whether they did so for the same reasons, whether they did so for good reasons, beside the point. My, imagine, my moral imagination was formed in a world where there wasn't a whole lot of difference on a lot of issues between the church and the world. That's not the world we live in now. And I think that means that we have to work a whole lot harder at persuading the rising generation that traditional church teaching is correct on a whole host of issues. And the way to do that, I think, is to, to think about natural, about natural law and a theology of the body. There's an excellent book, if, you, if you're doing a Sunday school class, I would say, for late teens, young adults, uh, there's an excellent book. It's written by a Catholic, but in the introduction he says, I've deliberately written this in a way that a Protestant can use it without any problem whatsoever. It's a book by Christopher West, and the title is Our Bodies Tell God's Story. And for my mind, that it's about 150 pages long. It's the most clear and winsome uh, expression of a theology of the body for Christians that I've come across. Thank you. Um, this question caught my eye. There's no less misery today than the Middle Ages. Where do people go to hear their misery explained? Jordan Peterson? <laughs> well, by and large, we don't go to have our misery explained to us. We go to have our misery alleviated. Uh, Leszek Kolakowski, the, the great Polish philosopher, has a phrase, it's actually a phrase I prefer to the therapeutic society, but I didn't come across it till after I'd written the book. He refers to modern society, modern, the modern West, as the analgesic society, which is designed to uh, cure pain. And interestingly enough, Philip Reef says that as the modern therapeutic self emerges, the self that is impatient with pain and wants to feel psychologically happy and satisfied emerges. Reef says that two institutions will, st will start to disappear or will become very difficult to maintain and two institutions will become very powerful. I actually think he's wrong. I think there are three institutions that come into crisis in a therapeutic society. The two that he notes are the nation and the church. And his point is, nation and church demand sacrifice of the self. When my wife and I were young Christians in Aberdeen, one of the men we knew in our church, a man called Sam Will, he's long dead now. He and his wife got married in August 1939. September the 3rd, 1939, George VI addressed the British people and declared that Britain was at war with Germany. Shortly thereafter, Sam Will, who'd been married for just a couple of months, signed up and went to fight. I think he was in India. Went to India to fight and didn't see his wife for six years. And he was not unique in that. And he did that because the nation demanded a sacrifice of him. And his understanding of the world was not one where his comfort was central. And therefore, he was prepared to make that sacrifice. Nation and church demand sacrifices of the self. They will get weaker. I would add to that the family, because the family demands a sacrifice of the self as well. We've all heard or used that phrase, nobody in this family behaves in that way. That's because to be part of a family involves limiting one's freedom to conform to a framework limiting one's comfort to conform to a framework. So there are three institutions that disappear. But Reef interestingly says, two institutions will emerge as very powerful and will gain and gain and gain in power. The theater and the hospital. Code for the entertainment industry and the medical industry. He wrote that in 1966. I would suggest that you only have to look at the, the economic figures to know how powerful the medical industry and the entertainment industry is in this country. 
you only have to look at the restrictions that were imposed upon churches in some states, as opposed to those that were not imposed on casinos uh, in some states, to know where the priorities of our culture are, and they track exactly with what Reef predicted. So the answer is, where do we go to have our misery explained to us? We don't. And I was chatting to a doctor just the other week, uh, a Christian doctor, and he was saying, one of the things today, he said, we're not taught, we're not teaching young medical students how to help people address the realities of their illnesses. He said, we're given ver giving them versions of, hang on in there and it'll be okay. Well, that's not explaining somebody's misery to them. That's pretending they're not really miserable. So I think we, we don't have misery explained to us. It's an outrage. And that's, that's why we go to the, the hospital and we go to the theater. It seems like we keep coming back to this need for biblical anthropology for the foundation because the confession of faith gives us misery as a word all yeah. the time to describe yeah. our condition. And it's, this is what it is. Yeah. And that's why I think psalm singing should be an important part of every church's life. No, I'm not an exclusive psalmist, but the psalms articulate pain and suffering in a beautiful and biblical way. And I think what we sing reflects the expectations we have of life and shapes the expectations we have of life. So I've been, for the longest time, I've been an advocate of regular psalms in church worship because the psalms, they shape our imaginations. They shape our expectations. I'm tempted to ask you a few questions about this article you just put out because I've got some. Do you have a few minutes extra? Sure, what are you yeah. going to say? I'm in front of everybody, right? And I'm asking yeah. you that. I've got to go. Uh, <laughs> we we know it, you don't. There's a gin and tonic for me out there somewhere. <laughs> I feel it calling. <laughs> That's right. Um, so uh, those you may not have seen, uh, Carl's last post was called The Failure of Evangelical Elites. And that elicited quite a response uh, on Twitter, which I thought was funny. I mean, this from the elites yeah. but disgustingly ignorant was my yeah, favorite was my, was my favorite yeah. insult yeah on twitter that was the best i part. never know quite am i meant to cry or yeah. resign i'm not quite sure what to do when somebody insults me on twitter that's yes uh. um but i did think it was helpful uh, maybe just to mention and that can spur you all to go read it uh, but i i think something you said that does become a bit of an extension of even what you discuss in this book um you talked about and you used Schleiermacher's method, um, who was a liberal theologian who used a method of basically trying to uh, accommodate the despisers of Christianity by adapting the message a bit. And you use that as a parallel to what's happening with evangelical elites today. But then when you explained it, you also looked at both sides of the, the, the issue there, those who are rage against what's happening culturally and those who want to accommodate or want to adjust Christianity. Yeah. Maybe speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I, I said that the, particularly in, in America in a time that we're living in now, that I think there's a twin temptation as, as Christianity is dramatically shunted to the margins. There's a, there, there are two temptations. There's a temptation to react with real anger because we feel that something that belongs to us is being stolen from us. And there's the temptation to for some to distance themselves from the great unwashed, for want of a better term, and try to present themselves to the culture as not being like those you know, tent revivalists over there, but being sort of sophisticated. Uh, and I, I think in some ways they're both, they're two sides of the same problem. And the problem is thinking that, that Christianity does or should own the culture and be at the center of the culture. And I'm not sure that the New Testament gives us much ground for believing that. The New Testament presents a picture of the church as, as a pilgrim church, as a sojourner church. Don't mishear me. I'm not saying here that Christians shouldn't be involved in public life, shouldn't try to be good scholars, shouldn't be good at their vocations, uh, shouldn't seek the good of the earthly city. Absolutely we should. But we should not be shocked or terrified when we find ourselves shunted to the margins. It's not that God's lost control. It's, I might almost say, it's that normal service is being resumed, perhaps, at that point. And I also think the thing, we need, the thing that the, the elites, as I call them, the mistake they make is this. Uh, the culture despises of religion. The, the, the problem with Schleiermark was, and the irony of the title of his work, you know, speeches on religion to its culture despises. Well, culture despisers of religion despise religion. It's what they do. <laughs> you know, in the same way that 
you know, firemen put out fires, teachers teach, culture despises of religion, despise religion. And it doesn't really matter what you do with religion, they're still going to despise it. And as you read those speeches by Schleiermacher, and they're brilliant speeches, and he was a very clever man, and I don't question his motivation at all. Uh, when I teach, I taught Schleiermacher this term, I teach, the first thing I say is we need to realize that his intentions are good. He's trying to communicate what he thinks is the Christian faith to his generation. But when you read the speeches, they're painful because he just lops off one bit of his body after another. You know, if I lop off this bit of the faith, will that be enough? If I lop off that bit of the faith, well, and the answer is no, because the, the problem isn't that the culture despisers don't understand. The problem is they despise God. Uh, and it's, a, it's not an intellectual problem alone. It's also a moral problem. And the, the I... I, I, I I use Mark Knoll and George Marsden, who are pretty upset about the article, I believe. But I use them as an example, partly because I have great respect and affection for them. And they had this project in the 90s that I found very helpful in the 90s. And their argument was, a lot of Christians don't make it in the academy, not because the academy hates them, but because they're just rubbish scholars. And they don't do good scholarship. And they develop this, you know, I think... A, a, on one level, decent argument that Christians need to be good scholars. Where they go wrong, I think, was in, real, was in thinking that being good scholars would be enough. And it's funny, I was on a panel at Grove. My first ever public act at Grove was being on a panel with George Marsden. And we were to ask, as a panelist, we were allowed to ask George a question, and I asked him a question. Do you not think that higher education in the United States is heading in a direction where Scholarship is one thing, but the moral positions you hold on the hot-button issues of the day are becoming the conditions of membership of the scholarly guild. And I was struck in his answer. And my colleague, Deb Forteza, asked more or less the same question straight after me. And she was struck by his answer as well. And we, I, I conferred with Deb afterwards, and her comment was, I don't even think he understood the question. And that's not because George Marsden is a, is a stupid man. He's far cleverer than I am. and He's made a far bigger impact on the historical discipline than I will ever make. But he's of a generation that doesn't understand what has taken place in the last 20 years in higher education here and elsewhere. That institutions of higher education have become political therapeutic contexts. Almost universally, that's the case. Uh, and he's operating with the old-style model that, well, if you play the scholarly game and you're good at scholarly, if you're a good historian, you can get onto a history faculty. I would want to say to him now, if you're a good historian and you're not willing to affirm gay marriage, you're not going to make it onto a history faculty. Not... Not if it's known that that's the position you, you took hold. to task to something I noted, and I think this is one of the key points of your article is the cult, the evangelical elites were willing to they'll deal with the race issue, but they won't deal with LGBTQ yeah. and abortion. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think that's not true of everybody. There are some people. Um, yeah, my. I, Karen Swallow Pryor, who actually emailed me and said, were you writing about me in that article? I said, no, I was not writing about you. But Karen Swallow Pryor, uh, for example, has, has touched on the race issue, but she's also written on the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. Most recently in the New York Times. She, she had a good article in the New York Times of all places. So not all evangelical intellectuals fall into that category, but some of the most significant ones do. There are large churches in big cities that are held up as flagships in this country where it is basic policy that abortion is never mentioned because it would upset too many people. And that's a problem. And I can't remember the exact statistic, but I think uh, the proportion of African Americans who die in any circumstance in police custody in 2018, that these are the latest figures we, we can get, uh, to African Americans who are aborted it runs at about, I think, it's about 390 to 1. Which makes me think, if you talk about systemic racism 
And abortion is not at the center of your polemic against systemic racism, then I want to know why. Because it seems to me that abortion is the most obvious and egregious example of the racial problems in the United States of America. But that puts you at odds with precisely the people that you want to yeah, what I would describe as the Manhattan cocktail mm -hmm. set. Back to the cultural despisers yeah. thing again. Yeah. Someone wants to know where we got our socks, because apparently our patterns are very similar. I don't know if that's true. Yeah. I got mine from Amazon. I think I got mine from Amazon as oh, well. Yeah. All right. Amazon. Twelve pairs for twelve bucks. That's I think. what I got. My daughter. Good value. <laughs> Every Sunday she wants to know what socks I have. So that's. My, I was wearing a pair the other day. My wife said, "You can't wear those. They clash with your tie." I'm color dyslexic. I have no idea what color goes which. But I said. But these socks are all tasteless. They, they all clash with everything. That's the point. So, yeah. That's the point. Yes. Exactly the point. Um, final question, and this one is uh, an opportunity for you, and I've heard this many times, so I am setting you up a little bit because I do appreciate this answer. Um, a lot of what you write about can bring a, a level of pessimism about the world we're living in, the culture, cultural moment we find ourselves. But I find you give a, a regular exhortation to Christians, and I wanted to give you a chance, you know, as we close, to share those thoughts, because I do think they're pivotal and they cross denominations. It's, it applies to anyone who calls himself a Christian. So I wanted to give you that final word uh, before we close. Yeah, I think there's, there's, there's a lot to be joyful about. Um, I mean, in general, bottom line is, even America in 2021, I'd rather live here than in China. Three million people in concentration camps in China. Uh, and, I, and I think that for as bad as many of us think it is in the United States at the moment, historically speaking, it's pretty good in a lot of ways. I can still worship on a Sunday without fear of being arrested and taken away from my, my wife and loved ones. So the first thing I, I want to say is, you know, we need to rejoice for the, the liberties and the freedoms and the material prosperity we, we enjoy. Uh, secondly, I, I want to say that, uh, I, I mentioned it, said this earlier from the pulpit, God is still sovereign. The promises are still good. Uh, the bad news is we all die. The good news is we do get resurrected. Uh, there's, there's no way of sugarcoating resurrection. Death precedes it. But unless the Lord returns sooner, we're all going to die and we're going to be resurrected. But that's a glorious thing. Uh, I, I think 2 Corinthians always strikes me as, you know, Paul gives this litany of suffering. And yet he refers to it ultimately as like it's a light momentary affliction compared to the eternal weight of glory that is to come. So I think there's much to be encouraged about there. I'm very encouraged with the younger generation, many of them. It's why I've, I, uh, Alexandra and I have done this piece for National Review Online, because here we have, you know, you've got a 21-year-old girl at Notre Dame taking a heroic stand, and nobody's standing up for her. You know, the students are braver than the professors. And that, I think, is across the board. The, the, the students are proving braver than the professors and the administrators and the leaders. So I think there's much to be grateful for. The, the rising generation get bashed a lot. I think they have it much harder than my generation did. They have much more debt. It's much harder to buy a house. It's much harder to find a good job. I think the rising generation get bashed all the time. I'm very encouraged by many members of the rising generation. So I think that's something uh, to give, uh, give thanks. And, and to rejoice in. And then I would say to, to us all, let's not let the big picture uh, detract us from the everyday joys that really constitute a happy and good life. The glass of wine on the deck with your wife of an evening. Uh, the friends who come around for, for meals. Uh, being together with your family. I think a focus on, on the ordinary is, is, is appropriate. Uh, one of the things that Twitter and social media have done is, I think they've made people think they're a lot more important than they are, and it's, it's made them focus on influencing people they can never influence. I don't care what people say. Anyway, you can say what you like about me on Twitter. If I read it, well, I'm probably not going to read it. My wife will read it to me because she tracks this stuff. I'm going to shrug my shoulders and carry on doing what I'm doing. You're not going to influence me. The people who influence me are the people that I rub shoulders with day by day. And the things that enrich my life are not the things so much even that I write, but they're the moments I enjoy with loved ones. So I would say, if you want to know how to remain optimistic and happy in this, enjoy the friendships 
and the families you have while you have them. So I think there's a richness to life that, it's one of the things that my Catholic friends have taught me actually. You know, I don't learn much from Catholic, modern Catholic theology, but some of the writings uh, uh, by Catholics on how to enjoy life has really made me think, yeah, the world may be going to hell in a handcart, but when I'm having a glass of wine at night with friends, that moment is joyful and it's something to give thanks for. So I'd say there's a lot to give thanks for. Uh, the and I don't want to leave tonight saying, uh, I don't want to be the Protestant Rod Dreher. <laughs> you can quote me on that, Tim. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Though Rod is a much happier guy in real life than he is much on Twitter. Much happier his, than, he yeah. than he appears? Than he appears on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. yes. A quick bonus question. If you were standing right in front of the elders of this church right now, what, in, what would you tell them they should focus on? Uh, I think building community. I think now is the time for churches to, to build community. You know, one of the spin-offs of the thoughts of my book would be identity is, is always constructed by the communities we're in, uh, by the relationships we have, and therefore the strongest identities we have are the result of the strongest relationships we have. And therefore, if the Christian, if our identity as Christians is to prove strong and firm, it has to arise out of a matrix of strong relationships, and the obvious place for that to happen is in the local church. So I would say, the, you know, the usual stuff, teach the whole counsel of God, etc., etc. Hospitality, building community, building friendships. Uh, that, I think, has to be absolutely central. You know, I, I shouldn't, I, I'm a huge admirer and, and friend of Rod Dreher. I think he's absolutely right on the, the local aspect of this. Um, who knows what's coming, but if it's as bad as it might be, the churches that will survive will be the churches that A, teach the truth, and B, have a strong, loving community. Thank you. Well, I just want to say thank you to you for this evening. It's been very enlightening and helpful, I think, to all of us. Um, Bob Albright is the man that we named this first of what we hope to be uh, periodic opportunities to have scholars like Dr. Truman come and those in our church who know Bob know he would love to have, he would be embarrassed that we named something after him, that's why we waited till he died, but he uh, would love to know that we were having this kind of interaction with the Word of God, then applying it and, and talking with someone like Carl about this, so it gives me joy to know that's the truth and just to remember that man and how he so influenced us here. So thank you, Carl, for coming and being this uh, this first lecturer in this series we hope to see if the Lord wills. Let's show our thanks.